who's got the edge in eyebrows today? Hmm? Who does? Is it you or me? <laughs> you always have the edge in whiskers. You do. You're a fuzzy little dog. <laughs> You're a fuzzy little dog. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Hello, BookTube, and <laughs> welcome back to your Daily Penguin. This is our tour through my Penguin Classic wall, book by book, author by author, period by period, and the last two videos, shelf by shelf, as we did first Anthony Trollope and then Charles Dickens, both of whom op occupy an entire shelf of Penguin Classics, uh, which was a time saver. It got us through two dozen books in two videos, uh, but it... it uh, as usual, it served as a reminder to me of some of the shortcomings of my beloved Penguin Classics. Some of the things that I wish they did that they don't do. And today's book perfectly illustrates that. Because today's book should be another shelf of Penguin Classic. We should be talking about another 12 books. And we're not, and we never will be. Most people don't even know there are 12 books to think about. And that is William Hazlitt. This is the Penguin Classic volume of the selected writings of William Hazlitt, who was a late Georgian, the term is man of letters, he was an essayist, he was a deadline hack, he was a biographer, a, a historian. He, any kind of literary endeavor that he could do, he did, and his favorite thing to do with his essays was to stir up trouble. It was to poke the complacency of his comrades. What is that noise? Free. No, 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 baby. Good Lord. <sighs> Give them a little camera time. They go crazy. Uh, the, I've heard Hazlitt described uh, by the very few people who talk about him today as the Christopher Hitchens of his day. Uncannily also physically. Uh, but, but mainly in terms of the firebrand nature of his writing, there's, there's no one that writes like him. Uh, even now, there's no one that writes like him. And... Uh, <clears throat> he's been on my mind lately. <laughs> he's, this author has been on my mind lately because during a recent trip to the really in the recently reopened Brattle Bookshop, I got this book, David Bromwich's book, Hazlitt, The Mind of a Critic. And uh, I read it. I think I mentioned it to you. It's, it's a little bit... Uh, it was a little bit tail-chasing, a little bit uh, dissertation-y for my liking. But the beginning of it, I want to read to you. Uh, Uh, let's see here. Let me go to the introduction because this is a note that is struck in the Hazlitt volume itself. This is not, as is not uh, isolated to Bromwich. Uh, Hazlitt's reputation today is puzzling. He is cherished as an essayist and honored as a name even by those who have scarcely read him. Yet writers can be, lo can be lost track of by thoughtless selection as well as complete omission. And Hazlitt has suffered both sorts of neglect at different times. The result has been a refinement and a diminishment of our idea of him. Three or four specimens of his writing, repeated in as many generations of anthologies, have sketched a figure in the minds of most readers, sprightly, debonair, essentially worldly, that blends into the atmosphere of Robert Louis Stevenson's hearty compliment, which was, though we are mighty fine fellows nowadays, we cannot write like Hazlitt. The figure we have come to know is indeed something like Stevenson. And once we have him before us, we can think of celebrated lines that confirm his reality. Quote, Reader, have you ever seen a fight? Or, This is, the Hamlet, uh, this is that Hamlet the Dane whom we read of in our youth. To be young is to be one of the immortal gods. All famous lines of Hazlitt. His ease is admirable, and it, takes ad it makes admiration easy. Even in a melancholy fit, he stays on the best terms with everything. This, he seems to say, is how we wrote once when all topics were grateful to the pen. This is how the world stood with us when even our self-knowledge kept us warm. The Hazlitt who, made, who speaks these lines has held stage for almost a century and made us cozy in our seats, but reader, I have never cared for him much. And to make his future a little less, a little uncomfortable, I have written a book about someone else. That's how Bromwich starts his own book on Hazlitt. And this edition, uh, of the selected writings is is edited by Ronald Blythe, the author of Aikenfield. Uh, it was, that will be his claim to fame, but he, he was also, uh, he, uh, he might still be alive, he'd be sinfully old if he is, but I've learned the caution of, of calling editors, Penguin editors, dead. 
uh, on this series because then invariably somebody pops up in the comments field and says, no, so-and-so is 150 years old, but they're still alive. <laughs> Ronald Blythe might still be alive, for all I know. He'd be incredibly old. He was born in the early 20s, I believe, but still. Uh, his introduction to his selection of Hazlitt strikes a very similar tone. I, I want to read you a bit of that introduction and then a bit a bit later on in the introduction. A conspiracy of caution has grown up around William Hazlitt. Unquestionably a great author in the system which measures writers for posterity, he has to be admitted yet grudgingly, warningly. An impression persists of a man at odds with all and everything, someone to whom his friends had to offer an almost saintly repose, a response if they were not to get their heads bitten off. He was a bitter creature, a malcontent, equally persistent in the hint of scandal, a rumor about making a fool of himself over young girls, which, in the case of Herrick, say, carries with it amusement and forgiveness, but which in connection with Hazlitt is loaded with Sunday newspaper innuendo. He was an irritant and a grit in the eye of his contemporaries, but he wrote as marvelously as any essayist who is not Montaigne could. Uh, so his work has always received high praise. Yet, in spite of this, most of the assessments of Hazlitt have a certain maggoty quality and are eaten through with reservation. Imagine reading that if you don't know anything about Hazlitt and you have a, 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 a revered English man of letters saying that this figure is widely misunderstood and that the critical responses him have a maggoty, eaten through feeling to them. Imagine that at the beginning of a Penguin classic. And, and Blythe goes on to say, uh, he was often so far ahead that he was fighting evils which his contemporaries simply could not see. He called their conduct Kant, a favorite epithet. Uh, but it was true that they often did not know what he was so angry about. When his strictures became too much, too outside anything they could comprehend, it became charitable to call him mad. And uh, that, <laughs> that hints, again, at the firebrand nature of this writer and also at the, the fact that no one was neutral about Hazlitt in his own day. Even the saintly William Wordsworth descended to ad hominem and, and canards, innuendo, that he spread, was perfectly happy to spread all the way around the literary world. I myself don't think there's a whole lot of truth to a lot of those canards. I think most of that originates in the viperous heart of William Wordsworth. But one way or another, uh, this figure ought to be represented by a much bigger book. The, because even his enemies, usually, will say that Hazlitt writes beautifully, more beautifully than, well, Blythe says than anyone who isn't Montaigne can expect to do. I'm not sure that Montaigne writes all that well, but, but uh, even so, if you made a tiny little rowboat of the greatest prose stylist in English, Hazlitt would have a place in that rowboat, and a, even his critics have to say that. And yet, 90% <laughs> of what he wrote is no longer available in any kind of popular edition. It's a scandal right there. There, There is, uh, at the very least, if we're not going to have a whole shelf of Hazlitt, at the very least, there is a much bigger selected volume to be done. And Ronald Blythe, in his, his introduction is fantastic, and in his introduction, he makes these cases. He says that this is a, char a, a character in English letters who is not very well understood by people who only encounter him in anthologies. It, the, the, him and Bromwich are correct. Hazlitt is inevitable in English prose anthologies. You can't avoid him. But it's usually the same two or three pieces, and no conception whatsoever of the breadth and depth of what he wrote elsewhere, and its change in tone, and, and its topicality, and its scathing anger. Most of those things are not in the frequently anthologized pieces by this author. And ironically enough, Ronald Blythe had to know as the editor of this Penguin volume, that he had to produce a volume somewhat similar to that, or it wouldn't sell if people would view it as an odd Hazlitt volume. He had, he had to know there were market pressures involved in his selections here. And uh, it shows. It shows less in this volume than in any other selected Hazlitt that I've read. But it still shows. This is The introduction is howling at the audience not to misunderstand this author. Don't tame him. Don't lessen him and, and soften him into something that you can write off as the neighborhood wit. But the anthology doesn't really do that. The anthology really comes, comes much closer to giving you the same kind of Hazlitt that you will see in other selected volumes. I think that's a terrible shame. I wish there were, at the very least, if not a shelf of the works of Hazlitt. It's, it's just criminal to me 
that we can have in English letters a figure this brilliant, a figure this eloquent, who's only remembered in little bits. And that happens throughout the Penguin Classic line, but in Hazlitt's case, it's especially annoying. If, at the very least, if there's not going to be a shelf of 12 books, then there ought to be a thousand page volume with excerpts from those books and lots more of the shorter stuff, lots more of the political essays, the cultural essays. This has a great selection of them, uh, but it could have a lot more. <laughs> it, could have, it could have a lot more and it would please me. And this volume, re dipping into this volume, rereading the introduction, rereading a couple of the essays, has made me uh, a little more charitable towards this. I may give this another go now that I've got the scent of Hazlitt back and maybe like it a little more. I will, I will definitely give it another try. It, I snatched it off the discard pile as soon as I finished rereading the bits and pieces of this. And this is one of those Penguin Classics where if I had a new one, I don't think they, they probably don't make a new one. A Black Spine Penguin Classic has the script writing and that gets rid of this color-coded bar at the top. If I had a newer edition of Hazlitt, I would keep this one for the Penguin Classic wall and I would put the newer edition in the bookcase of... Uh, literary figures, book writers, book essay and preface writers, because he, he lacking a, you know, a, a big volume like this, for a split second when I saw this, that's what I thought. I thought what I thought it was, that this was just a 500 page collection of Hazlitt's critical writings as opposed to a 180 page collection. And if there had been such a volume, that would go in a second bookcase and he would be one of the few authors represented twice in this room. But as it is, this stays on the Penguin Wall and is very much a recommend. <laughs> it's very, very much a recommend. Hazlitt's life was uh, tortured. He was angry at everything all the time. He was uh, unlucky in love, let's put it that way. Large parts of the time he was unlucky in love. His, uh, his first wife was very strange. And I think there may have been genuine love there, but it didn't work out. It couldn't possibly have worked out. And he was also fated for a bitter end, uh, an end you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy, believe you me. To have stomach cancer and die of it in a pre-medicine era is not an end you would wish on anybody. Uh, and uh, that makes for a, an involved and complicated picture. But you don't have to buy into that picture. You don't have to take that on your shoulders in order to read some of his shorter pieces. When you do, you will see what all of those people, Virginia Woolf and every other critic in the English language has said about this author, which is that you've never read anyone like him. Ronald Blythe says that in his introduction. Bromwich says that in his book. I've, every other introduction to any selected works of Hazlitt that I've ever read has said the same thing. And it's true. <laughs> it's true. I don't know about this Montaigne business, but I think you will very much like this author when you read him. You can find essays of his entirely online. Just, you just go to Google and type in William Hazlitt essay. And I'm sure you will call up 10 or 15 websites that just give you whole essays that you can just dip your toe in there. You don't even need to find a book. You can just dip your toe in online and see what you think. Uh, I'm glad to have this volume. Don't get, don't get my grousing. Don't take it the wrong way. I wish that Penguin did better by this author, but then again, I wish every publisher did better by this author. I, I've usually seen him in tiny selected volumes that don't do him credit. Don't do the credit to the, the width and breadth. I, the only person currently that I know in my life, and I know a lot of bookish people, I'm the only person I know who's read his biography of Napoleon. One of his great personal failings was a deep, almost spiritual belief in the rightness of Napoleon Bonaparte. I can forgive him for that. That was a fever dream that gripped a lot of people in his day. But uh, the book is brilliant. The biography is brilliant. And nobody's read it that I know. I don't know that there's a popular edition at all. Uh, probably never would be. And that's a terrible shame. That's a terrible shame. But anyway, I don't want the, the prevailing note of this Daily Penguin to be one of lamentation and regret because uh, I'm happy to have any volume of Hazlitt. And now I'm happy also that I didn't get rid of this thing abruptly. I will, I will go back to it. It's a study, of a critical study of Hazlitt that probably has a lot more in it. I probably just needed to be reminded uh, of how, how interesting I find this figure. Uh, so that is your Penguin for today. It's, we're back to one single author, and we'll probably stay that way for a while. I think the days of us doing a whole shelf at a time will be few and far between. So we will find out. We will reconvene tomorrow and find out who we hit then. And until then, I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.